very warm welcome to our evening service as uh, we uh, come to you again from Ferentosh and Rizalis Free Church and we are once again worshipping in conjunction with our, uh, our friends from Dingwall and Strathpeffer Free Church. May we know God's blessing as uh, we again gather around his word. Well, our call to worship uh, is taken from um, Psalm 105. Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Rejoice. Let's proclaim his name. Let's sing to God's praise. Psalm 98 is our opening item of praise. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord for wonders he has done. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord for wonders he has done by his right hand. near to God in prayer. Let's pray. We praise you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for the Son of your steadfast love, our Savior. For in Jesus all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. We give you thanks and praise that Christ Jesus, our Lord, is the bread of life. May our confidence be in Christ and in, and in Christ alone. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We confess our sins. We seek forgiveness through the Lord Jesus. You are the God of saving grace. Grant us faith, we pray, in Jesus Christ, by which we receive and rest on him alone for our salvation as he is freely offered to us in the gospel. Your word exhorts us to rejoice always and to pray continually. Teach us to pray. We acknowledge that we fall short in our prayer lives. Your word encourages us to approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace in our every hour of need. And you know our needs. You meet all our needs according to the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. So give us to cast all our cares and concerns into your hands at this time and at all times. Again, we, we commit to you our concerns uh, during these uh, difficult days in our history Again, we remember all 
whom we commend to your care with respect to the coronavirus. Shield and protect our loved ones, we ask, our friends and neighbors and work colleagues, one and all. And again, safeguard and shield all who sacrificially take to the front line as key workers and volunteers. Give us, we pray, to have a concern for the mission fields of the church across our world. We want to pray this evening for something for Romania. We give thanks for all the faithful supporters of SFR. We give you thanks for those who have been prayerful and financial supporters of this excellent work over the last 30 years or so. We pray that it would continue to prosper and grow and develop further. We too pray for the mission work of WEC. We thank you for those uh, who are long-standing mission workers such, such as Karina McLeod, and we pray that you would remember all personnel. We want to remember in particular final year students at WEX Missionary Training College in Brazil, and we ask that you would bless those who, who uh, graduate and uh, who are looking for your leading and guidance with respect to serving you. Lord God, have mercy on our nation. Your kingdom come, we pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Our, our nation, Britain, has become a mission field in itself. And we pray that you would give us to see the need to reach out with the good news of the gospel. Grant that in our relationships with one another, we might have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Give us to conduct ourselves always in a manner worthy of the gospel. So bless our time together now, we ask. May we be encouraged and uplifted by the gospel. Pardon, we pray, our every sin in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read uh, God's Word together. Our reading is taken from the New Testament, from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul's uh, uh, first letter to the church at Corinth, the 13th chapter. This is God's Word. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can, can, that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, 
then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. And we trust that God will add his blessing to the reading of his own holy and inspired word. Well, let's turn once again to uh, the letter of Paul to Philemon. And uh, we are looking at, uh, well, the words of our text in, in verse 1, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. And tonight we're going to continue from where we left off last week, uh, verses 8 to 11 uh, become the focal point for this evening. Let me just read these words. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love, the Apostle Paul says to Philemon. It is as none other than Paul, an old man and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. John had left home under a dark cloud of conflict. A year had passed. His wild life had brought him on a downward spiral of waywardness. Tormented with guilt, John often thought of home, longing to be reconciled to his parents. That was when John posted a letter home, asking for forgiveness. He requested just one thing of his parents on his return, a single draping white towel to be left on the garden wall as a symbol of reconciliation. Well, several days later, John made the long journey back home. As he approached his parents' home, he was afraid to lift his head and look. Would there be a white towel there or not? Well, he needn't have worried because there were dozens of towels and sheets and blankets draped and plastered over the house and the garden wall. John was overwhelmed and left in no doubt. He was embraced and welcomed back home. Well, Paul writes this letter to Philemon to ask him to be reconciled to his runaway slave Onesimus. Paul acts as a go-between, as a bridge builder in this remarkable letter. He is effectively asking Philemon to display a draping white towel or two and receive his wayward slave back home. We've given our series the title, A Masterstroke of Grace, because this letter points us to the very personal and powerful dynamic of grace and Christian tact in this letter from beginning to end. There's a great deal we can learn in this brief letter about mending broken Christian relationships the removal of divisive walls and conflict, and the art of gentle persuasion. So again, similar to last week, if you have a notepad, it may be helpful to take some notes. So where were we last week, just to set the scene for this evening? Well, we considered the, uh, the, 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 the paragraph um, prior to eight, and 8 to 11, we were in 4 to 7. We looked at three things. You'll recall how Paul acknowledges 
uh, in this paragraph 4 to 7, Philemon's proactive love and passion for the gospel, and he does so with thanksgiving to God. Why does he do that? So that Philemon can be encouraged to demonstrate proactive, sacrificial love to Onesimus. We also discovered how Paul is anxious to see Philemon share and actively participate in a gospel partnership with Onesimus for the sake of Christ. And we also noted how, uh, 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 how Philemon is encouraged to, to just be encouraged himself and refreshed, just as he has refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people, so he too can experience personal refreshment and encouragement by being not resentful to Onesimus, but receptive to him and receiving him back again for the sake of Christ. So we really do continue from where we left off last week. So, tonight, verses 8 to 12, we're looking at Paul's appeal, and we're going to consider two things. Love the higher standard, and love the supreme standard. Well, let's first of all look at what this, uh, this paragraph, this section in Philemon 8 to 11 has to say about love the higher standard. Don't you tell me what to do, and more importantly, don't tell me what I shouldn't do. No need to say to me what you would do if it was you, because I never asked for your sophisticated point of view. These are lyrics written and sung by the American band Air Traffic Controller. Philemon could have responded in a similar way had Paul told him what to do with respect to Onesimus. But Paul chooses not to order Philemon to do what he ought to do. Instead, Paul will appeal to Philemon on Onesimus' behalf on the basis of love. Now, Paul could apply what's been termed authoritarian pressure, taking advantage of his status as an apostle, his standing and high-ranking position in the church community allows Paul to push his weight. But he will not impose himself here. He will not dictate and determine what Philemon should do. Should Paul tell Philemon what to do, should he apply pressure, then it, it may result only in, in reluctant compliance. Philemon may feel obliged to receive his estranged domestic slave back and, and, and be seen to be doing the right thing, but he would be doing so grudgingly, perhaps even resentfully. You see, pardoning a slave for serious wrongs was, was extremely rare in Paul's first century world. Why should Onesimus be the exception to the rule? Well, Paul appreciates that pardoning a slave for serious wrongs is very, very rare. So, what does he do? He appeals to Philemon, he appeals to a higher standard, the standard of love. Remember the word that we, we referred to last week, the word agape, sacrificial love, that gives unreservedly and holds nothing back. The agape love of John 3.16, love without prejudice, love without bias, love without discrimination, the kind of love of which Peter speaks of in 1 Peter 4.8, love that covers a multitude of sins. This is the higher standard of love 
that Paul is referring to here. Hatred stirs up conflict, the book of Proverbs says, but love covers all wrongs, the kind of proactive love that compelled Abraham to say to his nephew Lot in Genesis chapter 13, in the midst of an escalating quarrel over property rights, Abraham says to his nephew Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and I for we are brothers, before Abraham went on to reach an amicable settlement with Lot and his men. Reaching out on the basis of love, Paul reminds us, is far more effective than applying the long arm of the law. And as Paul appeals here to Philemon on the basis of love, So he prays that it will rub off on Philemon, that it will impact Philemon, that it will leave a lasting impression on him. Again, remember the words we quoted last week, the words of William Arthur Ward, love is more than a noun, it is a verb, it is more than a feeling, it is caring, sharing, helping, sacrificing. And it is this caliber of sacrificial love that will move and persuade Philemon to have not not one white towel draping for Onesimus when he returns, but multiple towels and blankets and sheets. Love, Paul reminds us here, is the higher standard that is required in every aspect of our Christian lives as we read between the lines of what Paul is actually saying to Philemon, we're reminded that this is so. Love is the higher standard required in our quarrels, in our disputes, in our differences, in our disagreements, and in our conflicts. Remember what Paul says in our reading in 1 Corinthians 13, if I do not have love, If I do not show love and reach out in love, then I am only a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal, empty, hollow rhetoric. So, much food for thought there. But secondly, I want us to consider love the supreme standard. Now, Paul will tactfully attempt to draw a measure of sympathy from Philemon by referring to himself in verse 9, not as the eminent apostle of the New Testament church, but simply as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. Well, Some 30 years have passed since Paul was referred to on the pages of Scripture as a young man. You'll find that reference in Acts chapter 7 when Paul endorsed the stoning of Stephen. That's when he was Saul of Tarsus. Now Paul, the aged Uh, He's uh, now living in the evening of his years, nearing the end, languishing in prison for the sake of the gospel. And this is how Paul, of course, introduces himself at the outset of this letter to Philemon and back in verse 1. He introduces himself as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And we noted uh, on on week 1 that Paul does this nowhere else in his letters but he does so here for good reason, of course. Mentioning his imprisonment would immediately accomplish a compassionate response from Philemon. Surely, Paul is being held captive in Rome. He's a prisoner for the sake of Christ. His love for Christ has not been without cost. Paul's Christian service has not been without personal sacrifice. Well, again, this would surely resonate with Philemon as it should with you and I as readers. 
What would Philemon be willing to sacrifice for the sake of Christ? Will he reach out with the, with the supreme standard of love to Onesimus? With the supreme standard of love that is patient and kind, as Paul puts it so beautifully in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, with a love that does not envy or boast with that supreme standard of love that is not proud, that does not dishonor others, that is not self-seeking and not easily angered, that love that keeps no record of wrongs, will you, Philemon? And that love that does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth and never, ever fails. What will Philemon do? What will you and I do? What are we willing to sacrifice in our service for Christ? Do we recognize this supreme standard of love? Are we subscribing to it and applying it to our own lives and to the lives of those around us and to the lives of those who oppose us and to the lives of those who are estranged from us? It's very challenging, isn't it? So begins in verse 10, Paul's appeal in earnest. Now, this is the first time that Paul refers to in Onesimus. And he does so here in verse 10 by referring to him as my son Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. My adopted and much loved son in the gospel, Paul is saying in as many words. Or in other words, Paul has become his spiritual father. Paul says of Onesimus, Philemon's runaway slave, he became my son. Paul is, 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 is saying something quite profound here, because if you break down these words, he became my son, it means literally to give birth. Wow. He's saying Onesimus has been born again. He's a new creation, born of God, a child of God. He's not who he once was. He has been transformed by grace. And he's my adopted and much-loved son in the gospel. Will you not receive him back as your adopted son, Philemon? Look at verse 11. Paul says, Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both of us. Now again, Paul does something very perceptive here. There is a deliberate play with words, because Onesimus means literally useful. That's what his name means. So Paul goes for a pun on his name. Paul peppers this observation with a little humor. He was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both of us. But of course, it's no laughing matter to Onesimus' master, Philemon. You see, masters often give their domestic slaves names. Perhaps Onesimus, meaning useful, was an expression of Philemon's confidence in, in his slave. Here was a slave with promising potential. Well, Philemon would now distance himself from referring to Onesimus as useful and would probably prefer to refer to him as useless. But Paul capitalizes on this, you see, and says that, and says, now that Onesimus has been born again, he's a new man, and as a Christian, he has become truly useful, truly helpful, truly valuable in the work of the kingdom. Onesimus, Paul is saying to Philemon, is worthy of his name and can be most useful again to you, Philemon, if you will have him back. And this 
would surely be an act of supreme love. But something else as we close this evening. Paul stresses here an important principle, the principle of parity. In Christ Jesus, all of God's children are equally embraced and on a par with each other. No distinctions or bandings in the equality of the kingdom. No exceptions to the supreme standard of God's love. In other words, Onesimus's Christian sonship is no different to Paul's. It's no different to Philemon's. Let's hear the words of John. 1 John 3, 1. See what great love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called children of God. Well, Onesimus is not to be excluded in any way. And the words of the apostle himself, the words of Paul in, in Galatians 3, verse 26, really do echo very loudly as Paul appeals to, to Philemon. Remember these words, these well-known words in Galatians 3.26, in Christ Jesus, we are all children of God through faith. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, and listen to what he says next, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now, a first century slave master reserved the right, and it was a legal right, to have a runaway slave put to death. Paul knows this. And so he appeals to Philemon to receive Onesimus back as a spiritual son of Abraham, as a child of God and, his, and as his adopted son in Christ. Well, an act of supreme love really is what is asked of Philemon. Nothing less. How will he respond? You see, when you and I grasp the supreme standard of love here, God's grace, that is, that amazing grace that saved a wretch like me, then I too, and you too, with a grace perspective, will be constrained by the love of Christ to reach out to friend and to foe without discrimination. Will Philemon? Will you and I? Amen. Well, let's bring our service now to a close as we sing the words of love divine, all loves excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down.
let's conclude with the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain with us all. Amen.